see you. Matthew 28. So we've been talking the last four weeks about our discipleship process here at Life Church, what that looks like. And um, we said that uh, from week one, we said that uh, the first part of the process is sharing the gospel and uh, sharing our lives with people so that they can believe that Jesus is who the Word of God says He is. That's the first part. We believe in Jesus. We believe in God's Word, and we start there. We go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive by believing in Christ Jesus. So we move from that, that part of the process, and we go to the second part, which is we belong to the family of God as we connect to Jesus and to each other. Right? He's the vine, we're the branches, so we have to connect to Jesus, to Jesus in order to see fruit in our life, in order to see an overflow that can allow us to connect to each other. We're family. The third part was that we become like Jesus by training with spiritual habits. How many of you guys this past week implemented a new habit in your life? We talked about the previous Sunday. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, you'll get a cookie after service. Thank you so much. I'm proud of you. Hey, it's important, though. We can't just hear stuff and talk about stuff and not do stuff, all right? We can't be a church that hears but doesn't do. So if we're going to be like Jesus and be a church, if you're going to be a person that looks like Jesus, you have to change your habits. There's no other way around that. You have to put new things in to replace the old things that look like everyone else and replace them with things in your life that make you look like Jesus. That's our goal. That's what a disciple is, is someone who is following so close to the teacher that if you take the teacher out, you look at the student, there's no difference. It's a, it's a perfect reflection that what that student says and does looks like the teacher. That's, that's our goal. Is to look like Jesus. The last part of it is this. We believe in Jesus. We belong to the family of God. We become like Jesus through training. And then lastly, we, we become uh, disciple makers. We are disciple makers. We are commissioned to be uh, people who bring transformation to other people's lives to the power of God. And that's what we're going to look at today. So there's four things. There's believe, there's belong, there's become, and there's be. Be a disciple maker. That's where we're at today. Matthew 28, we're going to jump right into it. I'm in the Passion Translation. It says this. It says, Meanwhile, the 11, because Judas is no longer in the picture at this point. Uh, he was hanging around with somebody else. Uh, the 11 disciples. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. The, <laughs> the 11 disciples heard the wonderful news from the women and left for Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still had, had lingering doubts. But Jesus came close to them and said, All authority in the universe has been given to me. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. A couple things that, that's interesting here. Um, the, the first thing is this. It said that they met at a place that was already prearranged by Jesus. He kind of already told them this. And I, I was kind of looking, and there's some, some moments where they have some conversations, but I think they may, may have had a meeting that we don't see or read about here that he gave them specifically go to this mountain. You know, and I, I read that some scholars think that, you know, it's the same mountain where they saw him humiliated and crucified. Now they're going to see him in all of his glory. But they're going to meet in this place, and, and he says, meet there. So that's where they go. As soon as they... They heard the news that Jesus had risen from the dead. They go to that, that place that Jesus said, hey, when it's time, I want to meet right here with you. So they go there. But then the other interesting thing is this. Some of them still had doubts. These are people who have been training with Jesus, right? They've accepted Jesus. They're following Jesus. They've been training underneath Jesus. I mean, the teacher to train under. They, they see him crucified. They know what the prophecy says. They've heard what Jesus has said. Yet some of them still have doubts. Who would be honest today and raise your hand and say you still have doubts about some of the things you read about in Scripture? Yeah. Yeah. So these guys who have been with Jesus, walking with him, they still had lingering doubts, things they've been struggling through. Like, Lord, I hear what you're saying, but it's hard for me to make that sound right in my head, in my heart. I'm, I'm trying, though. So he appears. And when he appears, he says this. He said, all authority, all authority has been given to me. And, and, and what I'm doing is I'm giving that to you. He says, um, wherever you go, make disciples. If you're in Walmart, make disciples. If you're in the gym, make disciples. If you're in the classroom, make disciples. If you're at home, listen to your husband burp and watch TV, make a disciple. 
right? Wherever you go, he says, make disciples. All nations, everybody. Everybody. He said, I want everybody to become a disciple, not a convert. See, it's so easy to stop at, hey, get them saved, and that's it. We got our salvation numbers up. Everything's good. We're having these big revivals out in these stadiums, and we're getting people saved. But what happens after that? A lot of people, they don't know what to do after that, and they get right back into the same lifestyle because there's been no one doing life with them. We said that Jesus shared who he was, not just with his words, but with his actions. He lived his life with these 12 guys and said, look, this is how you become like me. This is how you become a kingdom citizen, uh, an ambassador for, for God, for heaven. And so he, he trained these disciples by modeling that life with them, not just getting them saved and walking away and saying, okay, who's next? There's no like drive through Christianity where you can get your number one combo and take off. Well, I got my salvation, so I'm done. I, I can go now. It doesn't work that way. And there's a lot of people who think that that's where it stops. I said yes to Jesus. I'm good. You're not. You're not because what happens is you're not connected to the family of God. You're not connected to Jesus just because you believe in him because we said already demons believe in Jesus. All right? They know he's real. They know what he can do. They know his power. The difference is to become a disciple is saying, look, I'm going to go beyond just accepting Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I want to learn to be like Jesus because I know how difficult it is to do things my way. My way does not work 99.9% of the time. Literally, my way has to be filtered through Brittany's way because usually her way is better than my way too. And so I know as long as she's following Jesus, I'm good because I can follow her and it's all good. You know what I'm saying? But it's true. We can't do life alone, and especially without Jesus. And so if we're going to be a true disciple, if we're going to go into all the nations and, and we're going to eventually get rid of these doubts because these disciples went on to help build the church and, and change the world. But if we're going to get rid of these lingering doubts and things of that nature, we have to continually make intentional steps to get closer to Jesus and, and go deeper and deeper in that relationship. And as we do that, we stay connected to him. We see fruit from that. We see things appear in our life, this, this fruit of the Spirit that appears. So as we walk, as we talk, we start walking and talking differently, right? Transformation happens from the inside out. Everything has to change if we're going to be like Jesus. And so he says, all authority has been given to me. Wherever you go, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to faithfully follow all that I've commanded you. He's saying, look... You go and do what I've done for you. Go and teach them to be like me, like I've taught you to be like me. It's a process of multiplying yourself. Once you become a disciple, the goal is to multiply that into someone else. Kind of like uh, the gremlins. You know, when they got wet, they one little burst out, you know, and there's all these little gremlins. Ever? Never mind. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to multiply ourselves. It's a classic movie. Go watch it. It's really good. So Jesus, what he did is that he released his disciples to go and make disciples. Matthew 28 is the releasing of those disciples. I've been with you for three and a half some odd years, and now you've seen, you've heard, you've watched, you've absorbed, you have the power now. We read last week that they were given power by Jesus before this moment to go and to heal all disease and to, to, to release people from all demon uh, oppression. And so Jesus released them with power, and they were going to get even more power right when the Holy Spirit came. But they were given authority as well. And so he said, look, I've done everything I'm supposed to do now with you guys. Now you're released. Go into the world and go and make disciples. I probably would have been a little terrified at that moment. Realizing, okay, this is really about to happen. I saw him die. Now he's here. Fantastic. Now I have to do it on my own. But that's what discipleship is. That's like parenting, right? You teach your kids, you do things with your kids, you let them go on a little bit ahead of you, and you watch, you kind of guide, and then one day, you release them. Yeah. Now it's your turn. Now, not all parents release their kids, or they still want to hang on to them, right? Like, no, I know you're 45, but you're going to do it my way. <laughs> but that's what Jesus did. He said, look, I've trained you, I've given you everything I've got inside of me, now go, you do it. But here's the cool thing. This is how cool of a parent God is, that, that even as the disciples were released, he said, look, I'm going to be with you every day until the completion of the age, to the end of the age. I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to try to give you some guidance here and there, but this is your turn now. I've given you everything you need. Now go and make disciples. Continue doing what I've been doing. We're not here to establish a political party, right? Because the disciples at one point, 
very early on thought that, oh, the Messiah is here to kick the Romans out. We're going to break some jaws. We're going to get these guys out of here and restore God's kingdom here. They didn't understand quite yet. And you know what's funny is 2018, the church still has that problem. Are we a church that's aligned with the Democrat Party or the Republican Party? Are we independent? We're none of those things. Listen, we're followers of Jesus. That's the only thing we're going to identify as as a church. And we're going to do what the Word of God says to do. Because why? We're by the book people. If it's in the book, we probably should believe it, teach it, and do it. So when he says to care for the widows and the orphans, hey, that's what we're supposed to be doing, caring for the people who can't take care of themselves. To reach out to those who are in need. Open our eyes. You can't expect the guy on stage to do all of it. Listen, we're in this together. We all got a part to play. And so when we step up as a disciple now, all of a sudden we go from me-centered and self-centered to people-centered, God-centered. How can I serve people? It's not all about me. How can I put my agenda aside for this moment right here when someone is reaching out to me for help, when nothing else can matter? The, 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 the yard can get mowed later. Right? I can watch this show later. I'll record it. What's going on right now? How can I be a disciple for you right now? How can I be a spiritual parent for you right now? That's the goal. Amen. So the early church, uh, they're built off of these disciples who were training with Jesus. And Paul had an encounter with Jesus as well. And he had a guy named Timothy, one of his, uh, his protégés or disciples or apprentices himself that he set up to be in charge of a church as a young man. He says this in 2 Timothy, if you want to look at this real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says this in verse 13. He says, Allow the healing words you've heard from me live in you, and make them a model for life as your faith and love for the anointed one grows even more. Guard well this incomparable treasure by the spirit of holiness living within you. It's important that what we get from Jesus... What we absorb from Jesus, we protect it. But we also use it as a model for how to live our life. Your church is not on the golf course. Your church is not in the woods. Your church is not at home watching a televangelist on TV. That's not church. That's being a consumer. It's not being a disciple. It's not being connected to the body of Christ. Now, I know there's exceptions. There's moments. There's vacations. Don't, get, don't take me too too extreme there. But what I'm saying is we can't allow those exceptions to be our model for everyday life. Everyday life says I'm doing life with Jesus and I'm doing life with each other, with the people around me. It's important. We have to stay connected to each other. The early church grew that way. And so the early church did exactly what Jesus did. As the disciples trained people, they released them to do it themselves. Paul released Timothy to go and be a, 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 a disciple of Jesus he trained him, and he released him to go and to, to care for the people of God, help them discover their gifts, and empower them, and equip them to go and do the same thing for the people. Chapter 2 of 2 Timothy says this, Paul saying, Timothy, my dear son, live your life empowered by God's free-flowing grace, which is your true strength, found in the anointing of Jesus and your union with him. And all that you've learned from me, confirmed by the integrity of my life, deposit into faithful leaders who were competent to teach the congregations the same revelation. He's saying, look, what you've got, the power you've got, that's the grace of God over your life. And, and what you have is, is a perfect union with Jesus. And I've helped develop that in you. And all the things I've taught you, I want you to now take that and find people who are faithful and teach them to do the same thing. Multiply. Like the gremlin. Get it wet and they, never mind multiply. He's saying, look, you have all this stuff inside of you. You have all this grace, all this favor of God. Now go and find people who are faithful, people who you can teach and train them to do the same thing, to say the same thing, to live the same way. It says to, to teach the same revelation, right? We can't understand what's in the word of God without the Holy Spirit because he is uh, the one who gives us revelation. We get that revelation by being connected to, to Jesus, the Spirit of God, all those different things help us to grow in our, our understanding, our knowledge, our anointing that comes from being connected to Jesus. And Paul's telling Timothy, look, I've done this for you. I've trained you. Now it's your turn. Papa Paul was releasing his spiritual kid, saying, now you go. It's your turn. Do it. Do what you've seen me do. 
So the question becomes now, we've seen what Jesus did. He released his disciples to go after training, after accepting, becoming, and training. Paul did the same thing. So what do we do? Listen, if you're in this room, you've accepted Jesus. It doesn't stop there. There's a, there's a process you go through. I told you a couple weeks ago, I think of baseball when I think about this. The goal is to get on the team, right? To get on God's team. But you don't, you don't stay at home plate, right? You hit the ball. You, you swing the bat, hit the ball, and you start going to first. And, and the goal is you want to get back home. To get back home is like you're going through that whole process of believing and belonging and becoming and being a disciple maker. So when you get home, now all of a sudden like, you're that guy. You've scored. You've won. So now what? Now what do you do? You become a disciple, right? And to be a parent, you have to reproduce. So to be a spiritual parent, you reproduce a spiritual child. So for me, thinking baseball, I think, okay, once I'm a player, once I round home, I become a coach. And to be a coach means that I'm looking for more players to get involved in the team. I've rounded the, the basis. Now I, I want to get somebody else to experience that same joy I've experienced. Help them become not only a player but a coach. So let's break this down. What are we supposed to do? We're called to be disciple makers. We're called to be the same thing that we read about in the, in the Word of God and do the exact same thing those disciples do as well. Not only train ourselves to stay connected to Jesus ourselves, but also find people that we can train and release to do the same thing. It never ends. And they're having a good time back there. It never ends. So I'm going to kind of recap some things we talked about. The first thing is this. What is a disciple? We define this, but I'm going to redefine it for you guys. A disciple is someone who has accepted Jesus, is following Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and is serving Jesus. They've accepted, they're following, they're being changed, and they're serving. That's a disciple. They've gone through the process, and now they've Started at spiritually dead, they become alive in Christ, and now they're out there serving Jesus, making more disciples. It's a process of allowing Jesus to transform our heads, our hearts, and our hands. Our heads is like a thought life, right? There's so much battle that goes on right here. Sometimes I think I go crazy, all the things that are fighting inside my head. I don't know if y'all are like me, maybe it is just me. But like the things that, that well, I'll think about, I'm like, why am I even thinking about this? Or why am I thinking this way about this situation? This is not at all what Jesus wants me to think about. Then I hear Jesus' voice talking to me there, and, and I'm refocusing. It's like this daily battle of like, uh, I'm going crazy. But I know the closer I get to Jesus, the less crazy it gets. The more clear, clarity I have, the more calm and peace I have in my mind. It's like I remember the, on the disciples on the boat when the storm's there. Jesus is like passed out. He's like just completely relaxed and chill, and the guys are freaking out in the boat, and he gets up like, you have a little faith. You know, hey, it's me. It's me. Calm down. I got this. Just trust me. And he speaks to the winds and the waves, and they, they calm down. Now, I'm sure you feel a little foolish after a, the storm calms down. You're like, duh, it's Jesus. He's got this. He's got this. He transforms our hearts, which is our attitudes, right? How we approach things. How we, how we speak about things. Our attitudes have to change. We can't have the same terrible attitude we had before Jesus and, and proclaim to be a follower of Jesus because it's not going to make sense. Or it's going to give a very, very bad impression of what a disciple really is. What a follower of Christ really is. There's too many people in the church that get offended by little bitty petty things. And, and that offense is just the, the, the enemy just throwing stuff out there. Hey, you should be mad about this. You should be really angry about this and just throwing this stuff out there and we bite into that hook, line, and sinker and then we destroy relationships where we make it really awkward when we see each other in public because we've been fools online or we've been fools by giving the cold shoulder or being passive aggressive and our attitudes have to change towards people, towards each other. The church is known as true disciples of Jesus by their love for each other and if we don't display that, we're not true disciples. That may be hard to hear, but it's in the Word. We're known by our love for each other. That's what a true disciple is, what the Word of God says. So let's love each other. Allow Jesus to transform our attitudes. And finally, through our, our, our thought life, our attitudes, He changes our hands, which is our actions. What we do changes. We serve people differently. 
not because we want to gain something out of it or we don't feel frustrated that we have to stop what we're doing to go help someone else, but it's like there's this joy to help. There's this joy in serving somebody. Why? Because that's the joy that Jesus has because he came to serve. He came to serve. Dude went to the cross to serve, okay? We can stop for a few minutes to change somebody's tire or, you know, buy somebody a meal here and there and help somebody out. We allow Jesus to transform our heads, our hearts, our hands, and we look like him more and more every day. The more we get closer to him, the more we see that transformation, the more we can see those things begin to manifest in our life. So that's what a disciple is. So what part do we play in discipleship? I want to break this down pretty quickly. We're going to go over this a little bit later on in 201 if you're able to stay behind for that. But there's three parts in the discipleship process as we walk through those stages of growth. Three parts is God's part, our part, and their part. Who's the there? The person you're reaching out to, the person you're loving to, the, 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 uh, the person that you're uh, trying to help connect to Jesus. So God's part is he does the transforming. Now, I know some of you guys that are... Uh, you tend to like things to be uh, your way and control your way, and you struggle with letting things go. And I don't want to say control freak because I don't want anybody to get offended, but you're not going to get offended because you're not those people, right? So sometimes we become control freaks, okay? And uh, we have to not only preach the gospel to somebody, but we try to tell them how they need to change their life. And, and when they don't change it, we, we condemn them or make them feel bad. Like, I can't believe you're doing that. You should be doing this, this, and this. Why are you acting this way? And we start to really hammer on people about this stuff. And we, re- we, we go into a place where we're not only doing our part, but now we're trying to do God's part too. Hey, listen, you're not the Holy Spirit, okay? Don't try to convict nobody. Don't try to do that stuff. You just do you, live the way you're called to live, and preach the gospel and let, let God take care of the transforming part. But that's our part. Our part is to just, it's just to share our life with people and share the gospel message. Love people. No strings attached. Just love on people. One of the easiest things I've found when, I, when it comes to witnessing to people and, and helping them discover Jesus is that I don't try to do some big evangelistic program speech with them. I just like to become friends with people. Because if I, if I think I'm just making converts, then I'll give them the track, I'll go through the little prayer, and then I'll walk away. But if I think that Jesus is calling me not to make converts but disciples, now all of a sudden it's like, look, I'm going to start with just building a relationship with you because I want to know who you are. I want to know what you like. How, wh- what do we have in common? Let's just become friends. Let's just start there. Let's just be a friend. And then from there, friends, the closer you get, begin to open up and say, look, I'm struggling here. God's, I need help here. What, what do I do about this situation in my life? My wife's about to leave me. Whatever. I mean, it can get real deep real fast, but it has to start with trust. And trust takes a little bit of time. There's no, like, quick microwave fix to building trust with somebody. There are some people who open up a lot quicker than others, but sometimes it may take a year before someone really says, look, I want to have a real conversation now. No no sports talks. No, let's just go look at flowers at Shangri-La and just hang out. I really want to get to a place where you can help me in my life. And it may take a year, but that's discipleship. Three years Jesus was with his guys, and they still had doubts. There's no quick fix to this or quick process to this. It's a lifelong journey. It ends when you go see Jesus. Take the pressure off, okay? It ends when you go see Jesus. But listen, we have, that, that's our part is that we have to be intentional to say, look, I, I'm not going to just fall into a relationship. It might happen if I bump into somebody at Walmart. But what's really going to happen to really build a relationship is I have to be intentional. I have to make phone calls, and look, just go ahead and break this out now. You can't be intentional with everybody. And if someone gets offended that you're not connecting with them the way you're connecting with the other person, pray for them. Let God transform their heads and their hearts because they're getting offended by something they shouldn't get offended by. You can't get connected to every single person that way. You can be friends with a lot of people, but to really be intimate with people, that only happens in a small uh, group of, of people. It's just natural. Jesus had 12 guys, but he had three he was close with, and he had one who he was really close with. So don't get, don't get overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus said, going to all the world, i got to make disciples. I can't even talk well. I stutter when I get in front of people. I'm starting to sweat now just thinking about my, I don't know if I wore deodorant today. What's going on here? Listen, calm down, relax, don't get overwhelmed, because the reality is it, it can just be one person. Listen, I, I'll go as far as to say if you just have one person you disciple for the rest of your life, that's a win, folks. 
that's a win. If you get one person to, to understand that they need Jesus in their life and you help lead them to grow in the stages of spiritual growth, that's a win. Getting someone on the teams a win and helping them walk through those bases, that, 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 that's what, you, what we're called to do. We have to do that stuff. Amen. That's a win. Don't get overwhelmed by it. But our part is not to do God's part. It's to just share our life with people and share the message. And their part is they have to accept the invitation. It takes a little bit of pressure off as well. You can't disciple someone who doesn't want it. You can't hold someone accountable who doesn't want that kind of relationship. You can't help grow someone if they don't want to grow. So you, you do your, your thing by building relationships, and at some point, you, you'll begin to recognize that they, they just really don't want this. And so you say, God, look, I planted the seed. I'm going to keep going. But, Lord, I, I want you to have someone come behind me and water that seed. And, God, but I know you the one make them grow. But, Lord, I planted, but I, I got to keep going. So help, help water that seed. And, and, and you move on. Like Jesus said, kick the dust off your feet and go to the next place if they refuse to accept the, the message. So that's three parts of discipleship. God's part, their part, your part. All you can do is your part. Don't try to get them to make a decision. You just present the gospel and let the Holy Spirit convict and transform and change and let them walk in that. So I'm going to wrap up with this. This is what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. Number one, you have to give up your time, your talent, your treasure, your plans. You have to. If you're going to build a relationship with Jesus, you have to cut out some time in your day to say, Jesus, I'm being intentional with you. And I'm going to have this time. This is our time alone. That doesn't mean I won't talk to you throughout my day as I'm doing stuff, but this is uninterrupted time for me and you. You have to have that. And the same is true with the disciple. you got two, three people in your life that you say, these are the people I'm going to really disciple. You have to give up your time. You have to use your talent. Maybe spend a little bit of money and, and readjust your plans so that that relationship can grow and you can help them understand how to grow as, as well. So the goal is we want to make disciples. We want to be disciples who make disciples. That's our goal. Amen. The church exists so that people who are far from God, can help, uh, we can help them discover life with God. That's our goal. And so as we jump on the train together of being a disciple of Jesus, we get to help each other, hold each other accountable. But the goal is, let's not lose sight of the goal. The goal is also to see people who are far from Jesus come to know him. That's why we're here. We're not here to feel comfortable in your chair for about 30, 40 minutes. I'm here to encourage you, build you up, give you resources, give you classes to help you to, to grow in this process of being a disciple. But the goal is to get you out of these doors to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's to go and be uh, uh, what, what people need out there, which is a representation of Jesus here on earth. We're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. And like I said, Great disciple makers are like coaches, you know, yes. and a great coach has to do a, a few things. They have to know the game. You can't, be, you can't coach a sport if you don't know how to play the sport, all right? You evaluate players, <laughs> build a program that allows you to win. Right. Same is true with disciple making. You have to know Jesus. You have to have the word of God inside of you so that you can use it as a tool to not only defeat the enemy, but help someone grow. And as you're discipling people, you get to look at them and, and evaluate where they are and say, okay, if they're at first base, if I want to give them a third base, these are the steps they're going to have to take to get there. Let me help them discover that. And you help grow people. And the whole time you're doing that, you're, you're creating a, a relational environment where that person can say, hey, coach, I'm struggling. How do I run again? Show me again how I do this. And you can say, watch me, and let's do it together. But then one day it's going to come where you get to release them and you send them home. Say, now you're a disciple maker. Go, run, be like Jesus. You've been training, now you do it. You've got this. I'll be in the background cheering you on, but you've got this. That's our goal, church. And so we're intentionally moving ourselves away from focusing on anything that doesn't relate to that process of believing, belonging, becoming, and being a disciple maker. Everything we do is going to be intentionally leading to to those stages of growth. It has to. We can't play church. We can't pretend like we have some other mission that Jesus gave us. That's it. Matthew 28, that is our mission. Go and make disciples. When you go home, hey, listen, 
there's a mission field for you right there. You don't have to uh, go uh, to overseas to, to find a place to minister uh, for the kingdom of God. Right in your home, whoever's in your home, whether you have your uh, spouse or kids or your mom or dad or whoever it is in your house, those people need to see Jesus too. And you can be 70 years old and still need to grow and go from second base to third base. There's a lot of people who have been in the faith for a long time and they've been stuck on base and they haven't gone home yet. That's what's so cool about the body of Christ is that whether you're old or young or right in between, whether you're, you're smart with math or you're good with music, it doesn't matter. Everyone has a part to play and we help each other grow. Iron sharpening iron. It's like, look, I've been doing this for so long, I forgot what it feels like to celebrate when someone gets saved for the first time. And you've helped me do that today. You never know. We're here to help each other grow. And as we connect with Jesus, that overflows that relationship.